this most enlightening presentation and let's get started. Great, thank you. Thank you, Denise and Shira and everybody that um, has been working to put this tour together. It's really a pleasure for me to get to share this collection um, with the Kansas City Jewish community um, and anyone who has an interest or a desire to learn about Jewish history and Jewish cultures around the world because that is where this collection truly, truly shines. Um, to get my tour started today, I'm going to share my screen. Oh, I got the wrong, there we go. And start my slideshow here. There we go. So, um, as Denise said, um, I'm Abby Magriel. I work with the Klein Collection. The collection itself is the result of more than 40 years of international collecting by resident and Yehuda congregant Michael Klein. It's, it's a passion for Judaica that has led him to collect pieces that are not just beautiful and unique, but objects that can be used to teach about Judaism and Jewish traditions. Objects in this collection span centuries and they come from all over the world and illustrate the lives that Jews have led for generations. So what is Judaica? We probably, um, we all have pieces of Judaica in our, our homes, a kiddish cup, a set of candlesticks, a Hanukkah menorah that um, you brought home from Israel. So it really describes a wide field of art and artwork. Many objects that are created in the fulfillment of commandments, the rituals we practice, the prayers that we say, but also the traditions that we've created. It also, um, as a term, includes Jewish artwork, pieces that aren't necessarily functional, but they explore Jewish themes and practices. And all of them, the objects, the artwork, they're all part of the concept of Hidur Mitzvah, fulfilling the commandment to beautify objects that are used in Jewish rituals and Jewish life. So what we're looking at here on your screen is the entryway in B'nai Yehuda's newly renovated building. This is our key car. Center of the a menorah that many of you are probably familiar with. If you ever visited B'nai Huda's home um, at 67th and Holmes, this menorah was part of that gorgeous mid-century building. And when the building closed in the early 2000s, this menorah was put away, packed away, and placed in storage. And it was brought out just about a year and a half ago uh, in the midst of the building's renovation. And it's become, again, the centerpiece. The first, and it's a welcome reminder of our community and the history that this congregation has. To both sides, to on the left, and on the right, this is where there is a semi-permanent display of objects and artwork that comprise the heart of the Klein collection. It's organized into themes. And I um, can show you a little bit. We've got just a couple of pictures of um, a couple of different views of this, of this area in the, in the building. Here's another one. You can see the menorah on the left and seating area in the center. It's a great place to gather. Not that we're doing much of that these days, but you know. But you can see into the display cases. So they're organized into themes. And they start with the holidays. All of the holidays um, are represented. Every holiday from Passover to Rosh Hashanah to Tisha B'Av. I mean, we've got every holiday, every festival, <laughs> every day that is marked in the Jewish year is represented in, in the collection. After that, there is a 
uh, section that is just beyond this image that looks into objects used in daily life in Jewish families and Jewish homes. Then a section on life cycle events. So a birth, a marriage, um, rituals around death, and then a section of objects used in a synagogue. Today's tour, because this is a sisterhood tour, I, in coming up with a concept for the tour, I decided it would make sense to focus on objects that are used by and for Jewish women. And I've pulled objects from the display um, from each section. So you'll see pieces uh, on our tour today that come from every part of this display. So let's get started. The first piece I've brought up, it comes from our Passover display and it is a piece of contemporary artwork. This is one of the newer pieces in the collection. It is a Kiddush cup, um, but more specifically, it is a cup uh, meant to evoke the lessons and the life of Miriam. You can see it's got all sorts of symbolism. Every So many of the pieces that we have in the collection have layers and layers of symbols, and I'm really having a great time decoding every single one of them. But this one, um, it is shaped like a well, as Miriam was the one who was able to source underground water and find water sources while the Jews were in the, in the desert after the exodus. The bottom is shaped and has the sounds of a timbrel. After that passage in Exodus, Miriam, it has it etched here in the top. Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after her in dancing with timbrels. And it, the whole piece together, which is made out of silver, it's made by an Israeli artist. His name is Avi Baran. And it's about six inches high. So a you know, nice, comfortable size for a cup. It's, it shows that, as the artist describes, that the, the timbrel was used while dancing after crossing the Red Sea and singing the Song of the Sea. And when you pick up this cup, you can hear the sounds of the timbrel. It makes this really delightful little chiming noise. So for our celebration, of Passover, a really great and really celebratory cup. All about Miriam. While we're talking about Passover, I always like to include this, um, this plate. So this is a Passover plate. It doesn't look like a Seder plate that um, we are used to or that we're accustomed to that has all of the spots on it for the symbolic foods. It doesn't have a spot for an, a spot for an egg or a spot for our parsley. Um, instead, the passage in the center is text from the Haggadah, but below we do have the order of the Seder listed in these in the large words before you can um, down here. This is the order, the order of the Seder. And around the rim are these really delightful illustrations. We have a Seder scene down here, up on top and upside down. Less delightful, this is a scene of slaves being whipped. So the story from the Exodus. We have floral clusters on one side and in the corners, Moses, David, Aaron and Solomon. So all familiar things, all familiar scenes and images um, in Judaica, things that are well represented. And it's a beautiful plate. It's Italian. It's about 17 inches in diameter. Uh, and it is a special plate. There's only about 28 of these plates known to exist around the world. And so this one is one of this uh, just incredible collection of uh, pieces of art that, that just haven't survived very long. But my favorite plate, my favorite fact about this plate is that <laughs> it's a fraud. This plate was created to look like 
It was from the 17th century and it was designed to look like it was from the 17th century when actually it was made in Italy after 1864. So why would this be my favorite top, my favorite fact about a plate, you know, something that's beautiful like this and something that is so useful uh, during a Seder? Well, I think it, it's fascinating because it tells a very specific part of European Jewish history. So in the 19th century, mid 1800s, there's a new and emerging middle class of European Jews. The Jews have uh, are being emancipated across the continent. Um, Jews are now becoming part of society at large and getting to enjoy the benefits that come with citizenship of all of these countries. Now that they have, now that these Jewish families have the means and the social position of a comfortable middle class, and in some cases, a very comfortable upper class, now there's a renewed interest among these families in their own cultural heritage. So now that they don't have to hide the fact that they are Jewish any longer, they are they begin looking for ways to cheer that that um, that heritage and show off their pride in being Jewish. They also have this newfound economic stability. They want their lives and their homes to reflect the wealth, but their history is Jews. And so they start buying things. They start buying piece, pieces of Judaica, new pieces, pieces that are antiques. And they are looking for ways to share this heritage um, and to show their pride in being Jewish. So this market for Judaica just blossoms. And so does the market for counterfeit or antique, you know, quote unquote, antique Judaica, of which this plate is one example. So for um, 150 years, almost 200 years, this plate and the other 27 plates much like it that we know of around the world, um, they were being marketed as much older than they actually were. And for all of these years, those dates were accepted. It wasn't until 1991, a Judaica expert at the Jewish Museum in New York uh, was researching these and published an article um, specifically about them in which she outlines the known locations and the different topics um, found on each one because they're not all identical, they're all slightly different. Um, but she determines that no, these plates are not from the 17th century, they're actually mid 19th century plates. And she's able to do that by looking at the illustrations and finds that the illustrations on this plate and the other plates that are very similar to it are all taken from or inspired by a Haggadah that was published in Italy in 1864. So if you look at this Haggadah, which we have a copy here in the collection, you look at this Haggadah that was from 1864, it's got its publication date right there. Um, these illustrations all appear in it. And some uh, artists looked at that and thought, oh, what great little illustrations. I can replicate those on these plates for Passover and they'll be beautiful. And I can, you know, make some money uh, as being much older than they to this researcher in the um, late 80s and early 90s that we know its history um, as being a 19th century piece and not a 17th century piece. But I love that it tells multiple stories, which is what I love about many of the objects in this collection, is that they tell us something about its use and about the rituals um, and the traditions that are um, explored in these objects, but also the stories of their own origins. As we're talking about rituals in holidays, I really wanted to include a piece relating to the, um, the ritual before Passover of cleaning your house and of cleaning your house and ridding it of all of the chametz. So, does, if anybody remembers doing this as a kid, or if you do it now every year before Passover begins, um, you have to get into every little corner of the house and sweep up any crumbs that might exist. 
so that the house is clean and ready for Passover. This little tray, this little dustpan, is another contemporary object from 2003 um, from an American artist named Chava Wolpert Richard. Now, she uh, has an interesting history. Her father, um, Ludwig Wolpert, was also um, a silver mass, a silversmith, master silversmith, and one of the most important artists in 20th century Judaica. But Chava went on and uh, continued her own career as a silversmith and created this really charming dustpan for cleaning the house and preparing the home for Passover. So it has, you know, it says chametz right here <laughs> in the tray. It has a candle holder and a candle for getting into all of those corners of the home so you can make sure that you're sweeping everything up and you sweep it up with a feather. So a contemporary Judaic artist, this time we've got a woman handling this, this piece of material. Before we leave Passover, I really didn't want to ignore these guys because they are some of the most charming pieces in the collection and in the display. So instead of having a Passover plate, a Seder plate with spots for all of the, um, all of the individual foods, this is our Seder plate too. And each of these little figurines, these are Polish. They're from um, the 1920s and they're small. Each of them is only about three and a half inches high. Each of them is, has the name of one of the Passover foods. So the lady up here in the corner with the basket, she has a basket for Maror. The man with the tray is our butcher. Uh, he will hold the shank bone. The wheelbarrow, he would be hauling some haroset. The man with the barrel down here has his carpas. Shoveling up um, the trough, the trough is chazeret, and the man with our basket holds his egg, his beitza. So I can't see these without wanting to, you know, arrange them in little <laughs> and play with them. They're just the that uh, the, the artist came up with this distinctive way of sharing all of those Passover foods, all of these traditional foods. Um, and they're just the most charming little little workers. I just love them and I would I love to imagine them on a Seder table. So we have so many menorahs for Hanukkah in our collection. Just last week I brought over from um, from Michael's home back to the synagogue, I brought over 35 or 36 menorahs. This menorah is in the permanent display and it is a real stunner. It's from Vienna. It's about 34 inches high, so very tall. This is a big menorah that we've got here. And it's from the 18th century, all in silver. I like this one for a number of reasons. It's really, uh, I love that these egg-shaped cups on each on each arm. I think the oil burning menorahs are really lovely. And these little cups here, these egg-shaped cups, they hold the oil inside and they have a, a place for the wick to come up through the top. And they're not eggs, but they are pomegranates. The, each of these is meant to be a pomegranate. And our figure here at the base is actually the Roman goddess of Pomona. And she is the goddess of fruit trees. So I like that this, this menorah has the, it, it is a functional piece. You light the lights for each night of the holiday but it's also that piece, that combination of history. And she is an example, Pomona here is an example of Jewish communities around the world that adopted uh, the customs and the traditions and the stories of the cultures that they were surrounded by. Um, in this case, this is a German 
you know, if, or Austrian, excuse me, um, a Viennese made menorah. And these Ro the Roman gods and goddesses were part of the story culture in, in Europe. And so integrating this goddess here, who is not Jewish, but her role is that of the goddess of fruit trees, which is you know, something that we are exploring with this tree, the, our tree, our pomegranates on each arm of our menorah. Now, some versions of this menorah, this is, um, there are several of others of these known to exist. Um, and some of them in this little bag at the base actually have a little, another little figure of Judith holding the head of Holofernes. So I, I like to keep on the lookout for those, for those stories. More, a uh, more Jewish story that. So, well, as we're talking about holidays, the central holiday, the holiday that we celebrate every week, our Shabbat, is never complete without, you know, a celebratory meal. And this piece I've included, not because it is one of the, you know, finest pieces of silver in the collection, or one of the um, most jaw dropping, you know, gorgeous pieces of work, but because I love it, I truly do love this piece, because it is such a great representation of Jewish life. So this is a pretty humble piece of crockery. It's 19th, late 19th century, early 20th century um, uh, ceramic. It belonged to a Polish family. It's only about seven inches high. It is not terribly big, but this is a pot for making cholent. So if anybody's made cholent, you'll know that it is a stew. Um, it, if, it's, if you're feeling flush, it's got a lot of meat. It's probably got a lot of potatoes and vegetables, but this is the the traditional Shabbat meal. If you're not cooking on the sh on Shabbat, um, then on Friday you prepare your stew. Um, the family would put it into the pot and prepare it, mix it up, seal the lid with a mixture of flour and water to create a paste and seal it up, put the lid on, and then take the pot to your local baker to your community oven and you can you, you put it in the oven to cook and it will stay there overnight and the as the fire goes out of the oven the residual heat from the fire will allow your cholent and the cholent in the and any other pots that are sitting inside the, this big community oven um, it will help it will allow it to cook overnight so the next day on Saturday, as you're coming home from Shoal, you can pick up your Cholent pot. The label here on front indicates that this pot belongs to the Pearls family. So it's got its name plate on it. You know whose Cholent is whose and you don't get somebody else's dinner. You bring it home and that's the only way you're gonna have a hot meal on the Sabbath. I think this pot and having it in our collection is another beautiful reminder of the daily life that has been that was lived by Jewish families and this isn't a spectacular piece of silver this isn't you know a 35 inch high you know Hanukkiah um, with silver and with uh, Pomona at the base this is a piece of, of pottery and while there are lots of beautiful silver and bronze menorahs that have lasted for hundreds of years, there are not very many cholent pots. Now, a cholent pot, it's a very utilitarian piece of cookware and also an inspirational one. A cholent pot was the inspiration for an American inventor who looked to his grandmother's cholent pot uh, for as inspiration for his creation, for his invention of the modern day crock pot. This is the original slow cooker. Before there was electricity in homes, you had the cholent pot that you dropped off at the, at the bakery. And in the 20th century, in the 21st century, 
we have the modern day crock pot, which you could set on a timer and have ready for dinner on Shabbat. I also didn't want Shabbat to pass by without including a set of candlesticks. As we light the lights on Shabbat, this is traditionally, traditionally um, a, the role that is assumed by the woman of the house to light the candles. And these are a really eye-catching pair of candlesticks in our permanent display. And they're big. These are 17 inches high and 12 inches wide. And it's from 1970, made of brass and wood by Ludwig Wolpert, the father of um, Chava Wolpert, who did the, um, the Hametz dustpan. So like I said, Wolpert was the preeminent American 20th century designer of Judaica. He was the first artist to integrate Hebrew lettering into the form of ceremonial objects. And you can see that on display here. Um, the, these candlesticks are, they write out um, a passage from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing gladly to the Lord. Let us shout out to the rock of our rescue. Wolpert was born in 1900 in Germany. He was educated in Frankfurt at the Bauhaus School where the, the, um, the thought there was that form follows function. And you certainly see that in all of Wolpert's objects. He left Germany for Palestine in 1933 to work at the Bezalel School of Arts and Crafts in Jerusalem, a school that's still in existence today. There, he taught metalwork before leaving for New York City in the 1950s to lead a metal, a metal and silver workshop at the Jewish Museum. Wolpert was known for synagogue interiors, for metalwork, for silver work, for works in wood, and he's, you'll see his work everywhere, and it's all beautiful, and it's got these very clean mid-century lines. Um, very recognizable. And uh, in my visits to synagogues around Kansas City, um, almost everyone has a Wolpert piece or two that you'll recognize. These candlesticks, um, I feel like had my grandmother had a set of these, she would have put, proudly put them out on her table and lit them. She, this was very much to her, to her style and mine too. I pulled that from her. I love these. Um, I think they're a great way to celebrate Shabbat with a joyful song, a groovy modern candle holder for candlesticks. And this is just one of several Wolpert pieces that, that we have in the collection. Um, Havdalah set, we have a Kiddush cup and menorah. So he's, he's a great story. Wolpert himself has a great story and um, I'm happy to have this cool set of candlesticks in our Shabbat section. Now, unique to our collection, we rarely see these. This little bag, this little purse, has a very specific purpose. I'll, see, I'll talk about it for a minute. Look at it and see if you can figure out what it is. It is uniquely Jewish. Um, and used by a woman. It's about eight and a half inches high um, and about the same width. It's from 19th, the 19th. It's this elaborate sequined embroidery covering the whole surface. And it, it has this little dangler, these little tools hanging down below. And the name of the owner is inscribed on this little plate here. So it's not just a little purse. It's not, you know, for carrying, you know, your, your lipstick, but this purse or this bag specifically for going to the mikveh. The little tools in, on the dangler, these are just 19th century Q-tips for cleaning every little cuticle, um, every little crevice in your ear. And you know that if, you have, if you are going to the mikveh and you've got all of your stuff with you and you have a bag that looks like this, 
You're not just going to the mikvah, you're going to the mikvah in style. This with this, you know, sequined bag um, and a little plate with your name on it. Yeah, this is the mikvah bag of a lady of means. So a North African piece of Judaica that is very functional, I think illustrates, and it, do, it just does such a great job of illustrating um, ordinary life for a Jewish woman. And men alike, uh, head coverings. The one that we have on display in the display cases is down here on the left, um, but the others are for meant for women. And I've included these because they are made using a very specifically Jewish form of embroidery. It's called Spanier Arbeit, and another word or another name, um, Spanier Macher, or Spanish work. This is, it's a uniquely Jewish form of embroidery. No other cultures uh, have used this form of embroidery. And you'll see it often um, on the neck piece of a tallit, that kind of silvery neck piece that sits um, around the top of the, the tallit. Um, you'll see it on yarmulkes, like here, on collars, on caps, on um, Torah breastplates, Torah curtains, you'll see it all over the place. It usually indicates um, and tells us that a piece is Polish in origin. The way it's made, um, it has these, this silver tape. I'm try I've tried to find a better way to describe this, but you know, very long strips of this silvery tape that is applied to a fabric base and so it's kind of an applique um, and kind of a, a blend between an applique and embroidery. Um, and they're, uh, they're attached to the fabric base in different patterns. And you can create curly cues. Um, this one on top has flowers on it. I've seen some that have a Star of David pattern. There are lots of different kinds of patterns that can be used. But I think it's amazing that this is, it's a Jewish art form. Tradition has said that it's, that these, this form existed as early as the 17th century, but I haven't, we haven't found evidence of that yet. Um, there are people who, you know, spend lots of time in their careers uh, studying Spanier Arbeit, but they say that um, that evidence isn't there, but it is still a, a beautiful form of handwork. Like I said, they're usually Polish and they never really got picked up outside of Jewish communities. So if you see pieces with this type of embroidery and this type of work applied to caps or a talus, um, you'll know that you are seeing something that is uniquely Jewish. Our wedding ring is another stuff that you would uh, put on the day of your wedding and then leave on forever. Um, this is a ceremonial ring. And this style of ring called the castle top ring is one that you will frequently see in Jewish collections and collections of Judaica. Ours is an 18 karat gold. Um, so it's especially fine. It has, it's, it has hand, engravings, hand done engravings all over it. Um, the little castle on top is hand wrought. Um, many of these you'll find they're made of silver or made of pewter. Um, some of them are stamped, some of them are made by hand. Ours is a really fantastic example. The castle on top, I say castle and that's what we're, they're referred to, it's also referred to as a temple top and it's the building on top is meant to evoke the temple. It's also to evoke the home that the bride and groom are now establishing together um, to begin their Jewish family. In our little castle, you can see on this side, 
If you can read the letters there, it says mazel, and you can guess what it says on the other side. <laughs> Our mazel tov, castle top wedding ring. It's from Germany and from about 1700. So this is one of the older pieces in the collection. And it's a, it would have been a community item or a family heirloom. Like I said, you don't leave this on forever, but this is something that days surrounding your wedding as a ceremonial piece of jewelry. And then um, the next bride will wear it after that and perhaps be passed down from generation to generation. So a lovely, really, really lovely piece of jewelry here. Also for the bride, but from a different part of the world is our bridal headdress. This headdress is from Afghanistan from eight, about 1870. It's made of silver um, with enamel and semi-precious stones studying it throughout. And those stones are something that you will see frequently in pieces of Judaica from this part of the world, from Central Asia. It's a lovely and jingly headdress for a bride to wear. Um, and so celebratory and again, you can see on the crown here, what does it say? It says Mazel Tov. So such a fancy piece of ornamentation for the bride. Um, no expense has been spared. It makes beautiful ringing noises for her as she's walking throughout the crowd. Um, just, a, a, <laughs> just such a celebratory piece. I love this. And also, if you're getting married, you're going to have a ketubah. This ketubah is from India from 1830. It's made of paper and it has some lovely watercolor illustration at the top. And below it is the traditional inscriptions, the, the, um, the language for the marriage contract. The nice thing about ketubas is that we always know exactly when they're from because they're dated. So with many of our objects, we have to estimate, a, you know, give a good, we get a good idea of when they're from, but a ketuba, you always know exactly when it's from, which is great. I've included this one today because it is Indian and it represents the Indian communities, the Indian Jewish communities. For hundreds of years, um, from about 1600 to the 1940s, 1950s, there was a um, vibrant Jewish community in parts of India. And those communities existed uh, quite happily and they didn't experience the same sorts of anti-Semitism that communities in Europe and in Central Asia did. The Jewish communities in India survived and flourished. And the only reason that they um, diminished to the extent that they have today, there are not very many um, Jewish communities um, of those original Jewish communities left in India. The only reason they aren't there anymore is because of economic reasons. A lot of those communities left in the early to mid 20th century. Um, and after Israel was founded in 19 family and, um, and resettled in Israel. So I, I, I like including these pieces from India. We have several in our collection, but just as a reminder that we have Jewish communities all over the world and that their histories are equally fascinating as the histories that we might be more, those that we might be more familiar with um, from Central Eastern Europe. So this piece I have, I really like to include because people look at it and they say, what in the world? What, <laughs> why, <laughs> what is this? I mean, it's a shoe, right? This is a shoe, but it's a special shoe. This is called a, a chalitza shoe. And it is a, um, it is used for a very specific kind of ceremony. If a woman, okay, 
I'm gonna give you this whole this whole you as a woman you are married but do not have any children and your husband dies then in leveret in, in communities that follow leveret marriage you are now expected to marry your brother-in-law right but but if you and or your brother-in-law decide that you do not want to get married you can participate in this ceremony known as chalitza in which the man the brother-in-law wears this shoe which is to be kosher it has to be made of entirely leather and it has specific properties that it has to meet um, and in the ceremony, the woman removes this shoe from the brother-in-law. And I have read some uh, accounts that say as part of the ceremony that the woman then spits in his face. Um, <laughs> other accounts say that does not happen. Um, so, you know, you've got varying traditions depending on uh, what community you're talking to. But there are still um, Orthodox communities that follow this tradition. So it doesn't happen very often because, first of all, you have to be, uh, you have to live within this community that follows this tradition and that follows the tradition of love at marriage. You have to be a childless widow. Um, so it doesn't come up very often, but it does happen. Uh, if you, if all you do is do a Google search for chalitza ceremony, um, you can find several contemporary accounts of this ceremony. Um, being played out. So this one, it's European. It's from the early 20th century. Um, and so, you know, it does look aged. And this is a, a ritual object that didn't see a lot of regular use. And so it is rather fragile, but it does represent this part of Judaism that I think uh, exemplifies the the equality and the sense of fairness that Jewish women receive. And the ketubah is one of those, those represented objects that it is a contract between the man and the woman, as does this piece, which, you know, we could consider this to be a form of divorce in which the two people do not wish to marry. Um, but, you know, granting the woman of the marriage, the, you know, rights that are inherent to her. If you have been to Israel and seen the tomb of Rachel, it's one of the holiest spots for Judaism. This piece is meant to evoke that site. It's a yard site candle holder or oil well. You can use it in two different ways. Either you can put a candle inside or you can um, unscrew this top and put in a wick so that you have got an oil burning lamp um, for your yard site. And it is built in the, it is formed in the shape of the tomb, the modern day tomb. It's a couple hundred years old, um, but that sits at the site of um, Rachel's death. Rachel uh, died giving birth to Benjamin um, and Jacob placed a pillar at, in, at, at that spot to mark her grave. This, the building is hundreds of years old. The site is of course thousands of years old and it's revered by Jews, Muslims and Christians alike. But the site is in a space near Bethlehem that uh, is highly trafficked and very sensitive. So it can be kind of hard to get there but um, once you do, I've not visited myself, but once you do, I've read that it's a really touching and really moving spot to, to, to stand within. This is a small piece. It's about six inches high. It's made out of brass and it's also modern. It's um, from Israel from the 1920s to 1940s, give or take. So early 20th century. As long as we're in Israel, I want to include a Torah Yad, a pointer in the early 20th century. So as a Yad, it's about 11 inches long. It's made of silver. It has semi-precious stones. And again, this is a product of that Betzalel school that um, Ludwig Wolpert taught at. 
the Betzalel School was and still is a vital um, organization for the teaching of fine arts. But upon its founding in the early 20th century, it, it, it was founded to be for, for multiple reasons, one of which was to create and foster a Jewish aesthetic for this new and not yet extant Jewish state. So it, the founder um, uh, created the school to provide a place for craftsmanship to work and to teach their crafts. So you had a lot of silversmiths working there, um, painters, engravers, people highly skilled in Jewish craft. And it was also a place to learn how to create these how, how to create these pieces. So it served a number of different purposes to teach, to foster this new Jewish aesthetic, <coughs> excuse me, and to be a, a, a place to produce arts for sale. So it was meant to generate a, um, to generate um, funds for, for the state of Israel. This piece, which was done by a Yemenite silversmith, <coughs> he he's one of the silversmiths that we know his name. His name was Yamini, and his family is still operating silver workshops in Israel today. And it's got several of these elements that make it uh, identify on top that you'll see in a lot of uh, Yemenite or Central European pieces and the highly polished silver that we recognize from European silver. So a lot going on in this one small yacht. Finally, this is our last piece of the day, but I couldn't do a tour without including one of our Torahs or Torah cases. I don't include Torah scrolls. We don't have Torah scrolls in our collection, but we do have Torah cases, Torah mantles. And this one is an example of a Torah in a couple of different ways. You can see it's spelled T-I-K or T-I-Q, but these are Torah cases that come from Sephardic or Mizrahi Jewish communities. Um, so this one is again from Central Asia, from Uzbekistan, and it's 29 inches high. It's from the 1920s or 1930s. And this also has that really characteristic look of that region, the studded gemstones throughout a lot of really, really nice detailed filigree work. The images that you see you've got the Star of David and the menorahs. And if you've never seen a Torah in action, the way it works is that you open it up. Uh, this is the front on the back, there are hinges and so it stays hinged open. And there are two wooden staves in the center upon which the Torah scroll is rolled so that when you open it up and you open up the scroll to your Torah portion for the day, the whole thing stands up independently so that the reader can just have it sitting there upright on a table. And so the whole congregation can see the words being read. So instead of um, having your Torah lie down uh, on the table, so you, you have to read from it upright, you have to read from it standing up, but that means that it's visible to everybody who is um, in front of the scroll. I think this one is just a really, really fine example of this tradition. It's beautiful, it's heavily ornamented. The rimonim, the finials on top match it so perfectly, and it's got all of these lovely gemstones. I think it's a spectacular piece to conclude our tour. So 
that is, those are the pieces that I've brought out today. Um, I know I haven't been looking at the chat function if anybody's asked any questions, but if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I know that, uh, Dini, you were, you were going to help moderate this portion. Yeah. Um, I don't, does anyone have any questions? I don't really see any. There's a couple, let's see. And if you have a question, you someone just want wanted to, to know. That. Someone wanted to know, it was actually from Shira, if the Hebrew letters on the candle holder and what did they say? On, oh, on the Wolfert candlesticks? Yeah. yeah. So they, um, it's from Psalm 95. Uh, naranina, l'shem nariya l'tzura yishienu. It's come, let us sing gladly to the Lord. Let us shout out to the rock of our rescue. Mm -hmm. And Wolfert often used passages um, from songs or um, passages from the Torah uh, in his works. And so that's a common thread. Um, we have, yeah, we've got. Does anyone Carol, else have see, any questions? I see Carol waving your hand. Carol, go ahead. Um, I wanted to remind um, many of the sisterhood members who we did that cholent, like a stew. Oh, the cholent, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know how many of you remember it, but it was great. They did a demonstration of it. And then we each got, I think, you know, the uh, ingredients other than the meat. Right. Uh, and I just would, you know, like to know if some of the rest of you remember doing it. I did go home and make it and, you know, it's just stew. <laughs> but um, I, I hope other people remember it. Also, uh, aside from the fact that Abby is a relative of mine. Uh, you did a fantastic job. Your knowledge and your enthusiasm and your ability to relate these objects. I mean, they're, you were just wonderful. So I want everybody to give a hand. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Carol. I see yeah. another question out there. Yes. Someone had asked about um, the Passover catcher. Yes, I have a question about what you call the uh, silver Passover catcher with a candle and the dustpan and the feather. Uh, what did you say it was used for, Abby? Uh, it's for your chametz the leavened bread that you need to rid your house of before Passover. Well, I just wanted, I, I thought that's what you said, but somewhere I thought I also heard something about getting dust out of your house. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, wanted to say that when I was really, really young, uh, we uh, had a uh, kosher home and I very clearly remember Around on the morning of the first Seder and religiously checking for uh, little breadcrumbs that had been hidden in window seals. And you use the little dustpan with the feather uh, as your sort of brush to uh, get the uh, crumbs into the dustpan. And uh, then you would use a candle to burn them once you were done. So that was, uh, this piece is a contemporary version of what was just a plastic little dustpan and uh, a bird feather that was used as the uh, feather. So it was a great custom and I have very fond memories of going around. My mother would sort of hide them yeah. and then we would go around to a couple of the window sills and uh, ceremoniously, uh, you know, rid the house of hummets. So, Aletha, are you saying that you didn't have to look in every single corner of your home to <laughs> rid of the hummets? 
<laughs> well, it was a selective hiding, I think you would call it. Your but mother it was, was kind. Yeah, but it was a fun custom, and I just remember it when I was really, really young, maybe four, five, six, seven, something I, like yeah, that going I'm around. I'm sure that that's where, um, where Richard, where, where she uh, pulled that that imagery from, um, from using a dustpan. And, you know, instead of having, you know, a plastic dustpan that you can sweep your crumbs into, might as well make it fabulous and have it be silver with that purple aluminum behind it. Right. Um, right. Just make it, make it really beautiful. And I also wanted to echo what Carol Yarmo had said. You did a fantastic yeah. job. There's Absolutely. so much research you went to, and it was just really, really worth Yes. Thank you. I have thank a you, question you. for Abby Beating. Hello? Yes, I can hear oh, you. Okay. Um, how much of his collection is in storage? Do you have everything out, Abby? No, I don't have we don't have everything out. Um, and this is an interesting uh, element of our collection that if you enjoy going to museums, you'll you'll understand this challenge that we have. Our collection is around a thousand pieces total. And on display, in those display cases that I pictured at the beginning of the tour, we have about 270 of those objects. So it's about a quarter of the collection that is on this semi-permanent display. We also have display cases that we rotate objects um, through for, for different holidays. The last holiday I got to do that for was Purim. Um, and so future holidays, we will have small short-term exhibits full of the pieces that are in storage. So we have a pretty good percentage of our collection that is out for display at any given time. Most museums, um, most art museums, especially, uh, especially comprehensive museums like at the Nelson, they are lucky to have on display at any given moment between four and seven percent of their collections. Really? So every time you go to the Nelson or you go to another art museum, you are seeing such a tiny fraction of their entire holdings. And though we would love to display everything all at once, um, we we show about a quarter to 30 percent of the collection at any given moment, which is a pretty great percentage. Yeah. And I'm glad that we have the capacity. Is he still collecting? Are you still getting more things or other yep. people donating? You have uh, other yes. people donating too? Yes and yes. So there are new pieces still being added to the collection. Um, this is it's a growing collection, it is active. And I think since um, the since I joined B'nai Yehuda last year and we've been sharing this collection, which is new to the temple, um, hmm. since we've been sharing this collection, there's been a renewed interest in con among congregants in donations of art. Um, the temple also has a, a collection that uh, existed before Michael's um, gift to, of this collection to B'nai Huda. So some of those pieces are incorporated into those that display um, that's pictured in that I pictured in the first couple of slides. Um, but then there are still pieces of art and ritual objects um, that belong to B'nai Huda for, and have belonged to B'nai Huda for decades. So um, there's there's both. There's there are pieces that are coming in from from all all angles. Well, thank you. I'll enjoy coming thank to see you. Very you. One of these yes. <laughs> I can't wait to have you all out here once uh, we're oh. able to reopen our building for public programs. In the in the short term, this is about as best the best we can do. But there's nothing like seeing it in person. Oh yeah, right. Very nice. Very good. Does anyone else have any other questions? This has been really enlightening. It's been yeah. a wonderful afternoon. Well, I'm so glad. If you do have any questions um, and you would like to email me or call me up in Ehuda, feel free to do so. Um, 
uh, Shira has my contact information. My email is pretty easy. It's just curator at b'neiyehuda.org, or you can call me at the temple. Um, and I wanted to let you all know that we have other programs, um, other virtual tours that we are doing just in this next, this coming week. So um, I want to invite you all to a program that we have with a visiting artist this coming Sunday. We have an artist visiting virtually uh, who specializes in Jewish paper cuts, paper cut artwork, which is a really fascinating field of Jewish art. She's coming um, on Sunday at one o'clock and she's from Pennsylvania. So, you know, were we not doing everything virtually, it would be, have been a lot harder to bring her in. Um, but that is open to the public. I invite you all to come and attend. And next Monday, I am doing another one of these virtual tours. The theme next Monday, boxes, you know, we're here in November. We are looking at ways to give and to give thanks. So um, both of those programs next, this coming Sunday and next Monday, um, they're both taking place at one o'clock in the afternoon. And you can find links to register for both of those programs um, through the B'nai Yehuda website, or um, you can visit the B'nai Yehuda Facebook page, or the we have a Klein Collection Facebook page as well. We're all over the place. Or if you ever have any, have any questions, just give me a call. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Shara, do you have any other questions? Do you have anything that you need to ask to uh, end us with? I don't know. I want to thank everybody for joining us. And um, <laughs> oh, we lost Shira. Oh, there she is. There are other things happening in the background here. So I'll make this quick. Uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs> and um, and I, we hope you're enjoying sisterhood. It's never too late to pay dues if you would like to. And uh, we hope that you can join us at our next program. Thank you for Thanks, coming. Thank you, Shira. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Abby. Me. I really appreciate being here. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye-bye.